Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm so glad to be able to offer you a new way to connect across all of our platforms here at the Williamsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's my hope that if there are moments throughout this pandemic where we need to close the doors of the building, that you would all be able to understand that the church is not closed, that God's spirit is not shut down, that instead we're going to try all kinds of new ways to stay connected. And I hope that this begins to uh, be a new process that you'll get used to, that you might enjoy if we have weeks where we can't be together, and that this will be a blessing to you and your families as we spend some time together in God's Word. I'd like to have a word of prayer with you this morning, and then we'll dig into the Bible, specifically considering the idea of thanksgiving and gratitude as we enter into this holiday week. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, how good it is to be in your presence. How good it is to live under your care, to be completely loved by you, fully known by you, and still able to stand in your presence. We thank you for the invitation to worship you this morning, to spend a day in Sabbath, in rest and communion with you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will be here with us. Pour yourself out into each one of the homes that's represented here and each family that's represented here, that all of us may draw, be drawn closer and closer to you this morning. We ask it in your name. Amen. I don't know what Thanksgiving holiday is like for you at your house, but at my house we have two traditions that my sister and I kind of come back to every year that we're in the same house together for Thanksgiving. In the morning when we wake up, we of course, we want to watch the Macy's Day Parade, see all of the floats and the balloons, and we love to watch the performances of all of the different singers and actors that are on Broadway, bringing parts of their musicals right out into the public square. We love the Macy's Day Parade. And then we also love to watch the old Anne of Green Gables that was made in the, in the 80s and 90s, and we just love those movies. And Thanksgiving, I don't know why, but Thanksgiving and Anne of Green Gables go together in our family, in our house. And you probably have a lot of traditions around Thanksgiving as well. I know each of us, no matter what our culture is, no matter where we might be gathering with friends or with family, our Thanksgivings will probably have a very full table. And as you sit around that table, you see all of this beautiful food that's been prepared, and you're ready to dig in, and you have just all these conversations at the table. You might try to start off on a really good foot and everybody say something they're thankful for. And then you try to keep your manners in check as you sometimes wander off and bump into a lot of areas that maybe uh, could cause nuclear uh, explosions at the table. And you, you kind of try and stay away from those areas, even though this year there's just plenty of fodder for that. We're all always concerned and worried about the things that are going on in the world around us, and, and they sometimes cloud our thoughts. But this morning, what I'd like to do is take you into God's Word, spend a little time on one of the stories out of Scripture that is probably one of the most famous or thought of stories when we talk about gratitude. But I hope that as we dig into it today, we'll see a deeper dimension that we don't often talk about when we talk about gratitude. So if you would turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bible out, to Luke chapter 17, we'll be looking at verses 9, I'm sorry, 11 through 19. 11 through 19 of Luke 17. 11 through 19. All the scriptures I'm going to be reading tonight are from the Passion Translation, uh, so they may not sound exactly like the translation you have in your hands, but I'm sure that we can keep up with each other. Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. I'll read the whole story for us here together. Jesus traveled on toward Jerusalem and passed through the border region between Samaria and Galilee. 
As he entered one village, ten men approached him, but they kept their distance, for they were lepers. You see, the lepers were often pushed out of community. They had to leave their homes and families. They had to stay away from people in general society. They couldn't work. They couldn't be a part of everyday community activities. And they had to announce themselves to anyone who came by, unclean, unclean, so that people would know not to come near them and possibly catch this disease that was just making their lives so difficult. So then in verse 13, it says, since they couldn't come near to him, right? It says they shouted to Jesus, mighty Lord, our wonderful master, won't you have mercy on us and heal us? And the word that they use there for Jesus when they call him wonderful master isn't just like a rabbi who's a teacher of disciples, which Jesus was. People often called him master and teacher as, as was customary to call someone a rabbi and all the people there with them disciples. But they use a name instead that he implies that he had authority and power over supernatural things that he has a, an authority that can alter the things that we see in the, nat in the natural realm. And they call out to him by that name, making it just explicitly known exactly what they were wanting from Jesus. It says, when Jesus stopped to look at them, he's face to face with these men. He spoke these words. He says, go to be examined by the Jewish priests. They set off, and they were healed while walking along the way. One of them, a foreigner from Samaria, this is an interesting thing for the Bible to highlight. When he discovered that he was completely healed, he turned back to find Jesus, shouting out joyous praises and glorifying God. When he found Jesus, he fell down at his feet, and thanked him over and over, saying to him, You are the Messiah. This man was a Samaritan. This is so interesting that this is highlighted here. The others were the ones who knew about Messiah. Here they are on the border between Samaria and Galilee, and what we find is that these men who usually wouldn't even speak to each other are bound together by the misery, by the loneliness and isolation caused by this disease. They are looking for their tribe of people now that they have been pushed out of their homes. And so we see here Samaritans and Jews together in this leper colony. And so the Samaritan turns back and thanks him. And Jesus asked, so where are the other nine? Weren't there ten who were healed? They all refused to return to give thanks and give glory to God except you, a foreigner from Samaria. Then Jesus said to the healed man lying at his feet, Arise and go. It was your faith that brought you salvation and healing. See, he had already been healed physically, but what Jesus says to him is, It is your faith that has now made you whole. This Samaritan man who turned around to give thanks to Jesus and claim him as the Messiah, the awaited one, the one who would rule, the anointed and chosen one, when he comes back and acknowledges him by that name, Jesus is able to give him a healing that goes far beyond his physical disease and brings shalom to the complete totality of his being. He's whole inside and out. Jesus highlights the fact that he's a Samaritan. And it's interesting to me because the ten all left to head toward the local synagogue and go find the Jewish priests. The priests would need to examine the Jewish men to see if they were healed in order that they might be you know, reunified with their family and their community. And only the priest could declare them prepared for that or ready for that or healed. And so all the men run 
to go find the priests so that they may be part of their community again. And as they're walking, it says along the way they were healed. One of the lessons we can learn from this story is that there is healing in obedience to God. He has a plan for us, a design for us, a way that we were made by him, that if we walk in that path, we will discover a sense of joy and peace and fulfillment that we won't find on any other road. There is a healing, a joy that comes in obedience. The other lesson that we can learn is, is we often think, well, those nine, they were bad guys, and this one Samaritan, he was the good guy. Now, those men, they went to the synagogue to have the priest look them over and, and check and see if they were healed. And my guess is, is that each one of them faithfully went through the Thanksgiving rituals that you go through. You give an offering, you leave a sacrifice, all of those sort of things. They went through all the forms of Thanksgiving that were culturally appropriate, that were, that were expected, and they did all of those things in gratitude, but they missed the giver of the gifts. The Samaritan man turns around looking for Jesus and running to find the healing that is his only in him. We see him run back and fall at Jesus' feet and begin just praising him and thanking him over and over again. We learn that thanksgiving drew this man back to Jesus. And there are a lot of things that we can learn about thanksgiving and gratitude and the real power of thanksgiving in our lives from this story. I want to share just three things Two that are pretty obvious that we've probably learned over the course of time about Thanksgiving and one that I think goes a little bit deeper. And I hope that we can integrate it into this, this week that we have of celebrating this holiday. The first thing that Thanksgiving and gratitude does is it really grows our perspective. It allows us to have a different kind of camera angle, you know, to have a bird's eye view, to look at it from someone else's point of view, to understand the gifts that we have in comparison to some others in the world. It helps us to really gain perspective over the things that seem so difficult right now, and yet they're passing things. I know you might be thinking, there's nothing in the world for me to possibly be thankful about in 2020. 2020 has seemed a little bit like a horror film that we're living through, right? The only thing we could... One good example of this is Martin Rinkhart. He was a priest in the 1600s, and he was serving as a low priest during the Thirty Years' War there in Europe. And he is in the thick of just war and poverty and starvation. And one of the things that happens in the midst of all of that chaos is a terrible disease starts to wipe through just all through the continent. And even in his local parish, he, he says that he was uh, doing as many as 40 funerals a day. And in the process of doing all those funerals, his wife became ill, and one of the funerals that he did was hers. During that time in Earth's history, they estimate that between 5 and 8 million in his courts with praise. Those are the words that you'll see in your Bible. But the Passion Translation uh, says it just a little bit differently, so listen closely. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise. It's almost like a secret code that lets you in the door. Like in those old movies where there's a, it just looks like a wall of bookshelves, but if you pull one of those books out, it turns the shelf open and there's a secret door into a whole new place. That's what gratitude, thanksgiving, and praise can do. It opens a door to a whole new place in our relationship with Jesus. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise, come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come bring him your thank offering and affectionately bless his beautiful name. This language is talking about being close 
and it's talking about a relationship. We can see it very clearly right here that there is a connection between gratitude and thanksgiving and being in the presence of God. When the Samaritan man realized that he was healed, he turned and he ran shouting praises to Jesus. And he fell at his feet and called him by the name of Messiah. And Jesus said to him, your faith has made you whole. Now the Bible says, Jesus said to, the, to who? The healed man, your faith has healed you. So it's not just the healing from leprosy. Instead, we see here this healing from God for every part of his life. And the door to that healing was thanksgiving. Paul has a great example of this, a teaching for us about this in Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse he gives, and then we're going to look at verse 9 and see the results. So this is, this is what he says. Philippians 4 verse 6, Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Do you see the, the way that Thanksgiving pervades the attitude of this prayer? Even though you're there to tell him your worries, you're there to tell him what you need. As a matter of fact, the next sentence says, tell him every detail of your life then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. In other words, we need to keep our focus on gratitude to be able to deal with all of the complexities of life, to be able to navigate those decisions well of what we focus on, what we tune our thoughts into. The safest way to navigate those choices is in a state of gratitude before our Creator God. And this, this is what the result that verse 9 says is possible for us. Follow the example of all we have imparted to you, and the God of peace will be with you in all things. This teaching that Paul gives says gratitude and thanksgiving are the prelude to God's presence. They're the prelude to entering into his courts. It's the way to come right into his presence. You know, there's another psalm, one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 16, that talks about this process of coming into God's presence. And you'll find that this section of scripture begins with David listing thing after thing after thing experience after experience, provision after provision that he's thankful for, and then it ends with presence. Let's look at Psalm 16, and we're going to start at verse 5. Psalm 16, verse 5. And it says, Lord, I have chosen you alone as my inheritance you are my prize, my pleasure, and my portion. I leave my destiny and its timing in your hands. Your pleasant path leads me to pleasant places. I'm overwhelmed by the privileges that come from following you, for you have given me the best. Let's just turn the page and keep going. Here's some more things he's thanking God for. The way you counsel and correct me, they make me praise you all the more. For your whispers in the night give me wisdom, showing me what to do next. Because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken. 
for I experience your wrap-around presence every moment. My heart and my soul explode with joy, full of glory. Even my body will rest confident and secure, for you will not abandon me to the realm of death nor will you allow your Holy One to experience corruption. And this is the result, all of this thanksgiving. And it leads us right to here in verse 11. It says, For you bring me a continual revelation of resurrection life, the path to the bliss. This is a joy word. The path to the bliss that brings me face to face with you. Many versions of the Bible, like the King James Version, it says that it leads me to the joy of your presence forevermore. Joy in your presence. That's a beautiful sentiment. No Hebrew word for presence. What this, this translation has done is it has said, it brings me face to face with you. That's what presence means. It means being fully seen, fully known, and an attentive, responsive relationship. This attitude of thanksgiving and praise and adoration of God, it brings us right there, face to face with him. And so while I hope that this this holiday of thanksgiving brings you closer to your family, lets you enjoy some beautiful food with your friends, My deeper prayer for you is that as you turn your mind to thanksgiving, you'll find yourself drawn right into the presence of the God who provides everything we would need. I want you to understand that that's his desire. His process, his whole point, the things he's passionate about, everything that God does is to reunite with us face to face. And so I pray that your thanksgiving, your gratitude, would be to him and would draw you closer to him in the giving. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so incredibly grateful for the way you counsel and correct and protect and provide for the way that you love and have redeemed us, for the plans you make for us, for the way you reveal yourself, for the fact that you want to be in relationship. There are so many things we could praise you for. Every breath that we take is a gift from you, and we are thankful. Lord, we pray that as we draw close to you, in thanksgiving and gratitude that you would draw close to us. The gift of your presence is all that we need, and we seek it with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.